Chapter 15 of The Mayor's Wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Cosby. The Mayor's Wife by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter 15 Hardly a Coincidence. The old lady's eyes met ours without purpose or intelligence. It was plain that she did not see us. Also plain that she was held back in her advance by some doubt in her beclouded brain. We could see her hover, as it were, at her end of the dark passage, while I held my breath and Mr. Steele panted audibly. Then, gradually, she drew back and disappeared behind the door, which she forgot to shut, as we could tell from the gradually receding light and the faint fall of her footsteps after the last dim flicker had faded away. When she was quite gone, Mr. Steele spoke. You must be satisfied now, he said. Do you still wish to go on, or shall we return and explain this accident to the girls whose voices I certainly hear in the hall overhead? We must go back, I reluctantly consented. A wild idea had crossed my brain of following out my first impulse and of charging Miss Charity in her own house with the visits which had from time to time depopulated this house. I shall leave you to make the necessary explanations, said he. I am really rushed with business and should be downtown on the mayor's affairs at this very moment. I am quite ready, said I. Then, as I squeezed my way through between the corner of the cabinet and the foundation wall, I could not help asking him how he thought it possible for these old ladies to mount to the halls above from the bottom of the four-foot hole in which we now stood. The same way in which I now propose that you should, he replied, lifting into view the object we had seen at one side of the passage and which now showed itself to be a pair of folding steps canny enough to discover or perhaps to open this passage they were canny enough to provide themselves with means of getting out of it shall i help you in a minute i said i am so curious how do you suppose they worked this trap from here they did not press the spring in the molding he pointed to one side of the opening where part of the supporting mechanism was now visible they worked that it is all simple enough on this side of the trap. The puzzle is about the other. How did they manage to have all this mechanism put in without rousing anyone's attention? And why so much trouble? Sometime I will tell you, I replied, putting my foot on the step. Oh, girls, I exclaimed, as two screams rang out above and two agitated faces peered down upon us. I've had an accident and a great adventure but i've solved the mystery of the ghost it was just one of the two poor old ladies next door they used to come up through this trap where is mrs packard they were too speechless with wonder to answer me i had to reach up my arms twice before either of them would lend me a helping hand but when i was once up and mr steele after me the questions they asked came so thick and fast that I almost choked in my endeavor to answer them and to get away. Nixon appeared in the middle of it, and, congratulating myself that Mr. Steele had been able to slip away to the study while I was talking to the girls, I went over the whole story again for his benefit, after which I stopped abruptly and asked again where Mrs. Packard was. Nixon, with a face as black as the passage from which I had just escaped, muttered some words about queer doings for respectable people but said nothing about his mistress unless the few words he added to his final lament about the cabinet contained some allusion to her fondness for the articles it held we could all see that they had suffered greatly from their fall annoyed at his manner which was that of a man personally aggrieved i turned to ellen you have just been upstairs i said is Mrs. Packard still in the nursery? She was, but not more than five minutes ago she slipped downstairs and went out. It was just before the noise you made falling down into this hole. Out, 
I was sorry. I wanted to disburden myself at once. Well, leave everything as it is, I commanded, despite the rebellion in Nixon's eye. I will wait in the reception room till she returns and then tell her at once. She can blame nobody but me if she is displeased at what she sees. Nixon grumbled something and moved off. The girls, full of talk, ran upstairs to have it out in the nursery with Letty, and I went toward the front. How long I should have to stay there before Mrs. Packard's return, I did not know. She might stay away an hour, and she might stay away all day. I could simply wait, but it was a happy waiting. I should see a renewal of joy in her and a bounding hope for the future when once I told any tale. It was enough to keep me quiet for the three long hours. I sat there with my face to the window, watching for the first sight of her figure on the crossing leading into our street. When it came, it was already lunchtime, but there was no evidence of hurry in her manner. There was, rather, an almost painful hesitation. As she drew nearer, she raised her eyes to the house front, and I saw with what dread she approached it and what courage it took for her to enter it at all. The sight of my face at the window altered her expression, however, and she came quite cheerfully up the steps. Careful to forestall Nixon in his duty, I opened the front door and, drawing her into the room where I had been waiting, I blurted out my whole story before she could remove her hat. Oh, Mrs. Packard, I cried, I have such good news for you. The thing you feared hasn't any meaning. The house was never haunted. The shadows which had been seen here were the shadows of real beings. There is a secret entrance to this house, and through it the old ladies next door have come from time to time in search of their missing bonds, or else to frighten off all of the people from the chance of finding them. Shall I show you where the place is? Her face when I began had shown such changes I was startled, but by the time I had finished, a sort of apathy had fallen across it, and her voice sounded hollow as she cried, What are you telling me? A secret entrance we knew nothing about? And the Mrs. Quinlan using it to hunt about these halls at night? Romantic, to be sure. Yes, let me see the place. It is very interesting and very inconvenient. Will you tell Nixon, please, to have this passage closed? I felt a chill. If it was interest, she felt, it was a very forced one. She even paused to take off her hat. But when I had drawn her through the library into the side hall and shown her the great gap where the cabinet had stood, I thought she brightened a little and showed some of the curiosity I expected. But it was very easily appeased, and before I could have made the thing clear to her, she was back in the library, fingering her hat and listening, as it seemed to me, to everything but my voice. I did not understand it. Making one more effort, I came up close to her and impetuously cried out, Don't you see what this does to the phantasm you profess to have seen yourself once in this very spot? It proves it a myth a product of your own imagination, something which it must certainly be impossible for you ever to fear again. That is why I made the search which has ended in this discovery. I want it to rid you of your forebodings. Do assure me that I have. It will be such a comfort to me. And how much more to the mayor? Her lackluster eyes fell. Her fingers closed on the hat whose feathers she had been trifling with, and, lifting it, she moved softly into the reception room, and from there into the hall and up the front stairs. I stood aghast. She had not even heard what I had been saying. By the time I had recovered my equanimity enough to follow, she had disappeared into her own room. It could not have been in a very comfortable condition, for there were evidences about the hall that it was being thoroughly swept. As I endeavored to pass the door, I inadvertently struck the edge of a little tabaret standing in my way. It toppled and a little book lying on it slid to the floor. As I stooped to pick it up, my already greatly disconcerted mind was still further affected by the glimpse which was given me of its title. It was this, The Eccentricities of Ghosts, 
and coincidences suggesting spiritual interference struck forcibly by a coincidence suggesting something quite different from spiritual interference i allowed the book to open in my hand which it did at this evidently frequently conned passage a book was in my hand and a strong light was shining on it and on me from a lamp on a nearby table the story was interesting and i was following the adventures it was relating with eager interest when suddenly the character of the light changed a mist seemed to pass before my eyes and on my looking up i saw standing between me and the lamp the figure of a man which vanished as i looked leaving in my breast an unutterable dread and in my memory the glare of two unearthly eyes whose menace could mean but one thing death the next day i received news of a fatal accident to my husband i closed the little volume with very strange thoughts if mayor packard had believed himself to have received an explanation of his wife's strange condition in the confession she had made of having seen an apparition such as this in her library or if i had believed myself to have touched the bottom of the mystery absorbing this unhappy household and my futile discoveries of the human and practical character of the visitants who had haunted this house then mayor packard and i had made a grave mistake end of chapter fifteen recording by tom cosby of the mayor's wife this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Tom Cosby The Mayor's Wife by Anna Catherine Green Chapter 16 In the Library I was still in Mrs. Packard's room, brooding over the enigma offered by the similarity between the account I had just read and the explanation she had given of the mysterious event which had thrown such a cloud over her life, when, moved by some unaccountable influence, I glanced up and saw Nixon standing in the open doorway, gazing at me with an uneasy curiosity I was sorry enough to have inspired. Mrs. Packard wants you, he declared with short ceremony. She's in the library, and, turning on his heel, he took his deliberate way downstairs. I followed hard after him, and, being brisk in my movements, was at his back before he was halfway to the bottom. He seemed to resent this, for he turned a baleful look back at me and purposely delayed his steps without giving me the right of way. Is Mrs. Packard in a hurry? I asked. If so, you had better let me pass. He gave no appearance of having heard me. His attention had been caught by something going on at the rear of the hall we were now approaching. Following his anxious glance, I saw the door of the mayor's study open and Mrs. Packard come out. As we reached the lower step, she passed us on her way to the library. Wondering what errand had taken her to the study, which she was supposed not to visit, I turned to join her and caught a glimpse of the old man's face. It was more puckered, scowling, and malignant of aspect than usual. I was surprised that Mrs. Packard had not noticed it. Surely it was not the countenance of a mere disgruntled servant. Something not to be seen on the surface was disturbing this old man, and, moving in the shadows as I was, I questioned whether it would not conduce to some explanation between Mrs. Packard and myself if I addressed her on the subject of this old self-serving man's peculiar ways but the opportunity for doing this did not come that morning on entering the library i was met by mrs packard with the remark have you any interest in politics do you know anything about the subject i have an interest in mayor packard's election i smilingly assured her and i know that in this i represent a great number of people in this town if not in the state 
You want to see him governor? You desired this before you came to this house? You believe him to be a good man, the right man for the place? I certainly do, Mrs. Packard. And you represent a large class who feel the same? I think so, Mrs. Packard. I am so glad. Her tone was almost hysterical. My heart is set on this election, she ardently explained. It means so much this year. My husband is very ambitious. So am I for him. I would give. There she paused, caught back, it would seem, by some warning thought. I took advantage of her preoccupation to scrutinize her features more closely than I had dared to do while she was directly addressing me. I found them set in the stern mold of profound feeling, womanly feeling, no doubt, but one actuated by causes far greater than the subject, serious as it was, apparently called for. She would give? What lay behind that give? I never knew, for she never finished her sentence. Observing the breathless interest her manner evoked, or possibly realizing how nearly she had come to an unnecessary, if not unwise, self-betrayal, she suddenly smoothed her brow and, catching up a piece of embroidery from the table, sat down with it in her hand. A wife is naturally heart and soul with her husband, she observed, with an assumption of composure which restored some sort of naturalness to the conversation. You are a thinking person, I see, and what is more, a conscientious one. There are many, many such in town, many amongst the men as well as amongst the women. Do you think I am in earnest about this, that Mr. Packard's chances could be affected by, by anything that might be said about me? You saw, or heard us say, at least, that my name had been mentioned in the morning paper in a way not altogether agreeable to us. It was false, of course, but— She started, and her work fell from her hands. The doorbell had rung, and we could hear Nixon in the hall hastening to answer it. Miss Saunders, she hurriedly interposed with a great effort to speak naturally, I have told Nixon that I wish to see Mr. Steele if he comes in this morning. I wish to speak to him about the commission entrusted to him by my husband. I confess, Mr. Steele has not inspired me with the confidence that Mr. Packard feels in him, and I rather shrink from this interview. Will you be good enough? Rather, will you show me the great kindness of sitting on that low divan by the fireplace, where you will not be visible? See, you may have my work to busy yourself with, and if, he may not, you know, if he should show the slightest disposition to transgress in any way, rise and show yourself. I was conscious of flushing slightly, but she was not looking my way, and the betrayal cost me only a passing uneasiness. She had quite, without realizing it, offered me the one opportunity I most desired, and my search for a new explanation of Mrs. Packard's rapidly changing moods I had returned to my first suspicion. The attraction and possibly the passion of the handsome secretary for herself. I had very little reason for entertaining such a possibility. I had seen nothing on his part to justify it and but little on hers. Yet, in the absence of every other convincing cause of trouble, I allowed myself to dwell on this one and congratulated myself upon the chance she now offered me of seeing and hearing how he would comport himself when he thought that he was alone with her. Assured by the sounds in the hall that Mr. Steele was approaching, I signified my acquiescence with her wishes and, taking the embroidery from her hand, sat down in the place she had pointed out. I heard the deep breath she drew forgot in an instant my purpose of questioning her concerning Nixon, and settled myself to listen, not only to such words as must inevitably pass between them, but to their tones, to the unconscious sigh, to whatever might betray his feeling toward her or hers toward him. 
convinced as i now was that feeling of some kind lay back of an interview which she feared to hold without the support of another secret presence the calm even tones of the gentleman himself modulated to an expression of utmost deference were the first to break the silence you wish to see me mrs packard yes the tremble in this ordinary monosyllable was slight but quite perceptible mr packard has given you a task concerning the necessity of which i should be glad to learn your opinion do you think it wise to to probe into such matters not that i mean to deter you you are under mr packard's orders but a word from so experienced a man would be welcome if only to reconcile me to an effort which must lead to the indiscriminate use of my name in quarters where it hurts a woman to imagine it used at all this with her eyes on his face of this i felt sure her tone was much too level for her not to be looking directly at him to any response he might give of the same nature i had no clue but his tone when he answered was as cool and deferentially polite as was to be expected from a man chosen by mayor packard for his private secretary mrs packard your fears are very natural a woman shrinks from such inquiries even when sustained by the consciousness that nothing can rob her name of its deserved honor but if we let one innuendo pass how can we prevent a second the man who did this thing should be punished in this i agree with mayor packard she stirred impulsively i could hear the rustle of her dress as she moved probably to lessen the distance between them you are honest with me she urged you do agree with mr packard in this his answer was firm straightforward and as far as i could judge free from any objectionable feature i certainly do mrs packard the hesitation i expressed when he first spoke was caused by the one consideration mentioned my fear lest something might go amiss in c to-night if i busied myself otherwise than with the necessities of the speech with which he is about to open his campaign i see you are very desirous that mr packard should win in this election i am his secretary and was largely instrumental in securing his nomination for governor was the simple reply there was a pause how filled i would have given half my expected salary to know then i heard her ask him the very question she had asked me do you think that in the event of your not succeeding in forcing an apology from the man who inserted that objectionable paragraph against myself that that such hints of something being wrong with me will in any way affect mr packard's chances lose him votes i mean will the husband suffer because of some imagined lack in his wife one cannot say thus appealed to the man seemed to weigh his words carefully out of consideration for her i thought no real admirer of the mayor's would go over to the enemy from any such cause as that only the doubtful the half-hearted those who are ready to grasp at any excuse for voting with the other party would allow a consideration of the mayor's domestic relations to interfere with their confidence in him as a public officer but these how i wish i could have seen her face these half-hearted voters their easily stifled convictions are what make majorities she stammered mr steele may have bowed he probably did for she went on confidently and with a certain authority not observable in the tone of her previous remarks you are right the paragraph reflecting on me must be traced to its source the lie must be met and grappled with i was not well last week and showed it but i am perfectly well today and am resolved to show that too no skeleton hangs in the packard closet i am a happy wife and a happy mother let them come here and see 
this morning i shall issue invitations for a dinner to be given the first night you can assure me mr packard will be at home do you know of any such night on friday week he has no speech to make mrs packard seemed to consider finally she said when you see him tell him to leave that evening free and mr steele if you will be so good give me the names of some of those half-hearted ones critical people who have to see in order to believe i shall have them at my table i shall let them see that the shadow which enveloped me was ephemeral that a woman can rise above all weakness in the support of a husband she loves and honors as i do mr packard she must have looked majestic her voice thrilling with anticipated triumph rang through the room awaking echoes which surely must have touched the heart of this man if as i had sometimes thought he cherished an unwelcome admiration for her but when he answered there was no hint in his finely modulated tones of any chord having been touched in his breast save the legitimate one of respectful appreciation of a woman who fulfilled the expectation of one alive to what is admirable in her sex your idea is a happy one said he i can give you three names now those of judge whittaker mr dumont the lawyer and the two mowrys father and son thank you i am indebted to you mr steele for the patience with which you have met and answered my doubts he made some reply added something about not seeing her again till he returned with the mayor then i heard the door open and quietly shut the interview was over without my having felt called upon to show myself an interval of silence and then i heard her voice she had thrown herself down at the piano and was singing gaily ecstatically approaching her in undisguised wonder at this new mood i stood at her back and listened i do not suppose she had what is called a great voice but the feeling back of it at this moment of reaction gave it a great quality the piece some operatic aria was sung in a way to thrill the soul opening with a burst it ended with low notes of an intense sweetness like sobs not of grief but happiness in their midst and while the tone sank deepest a child's voice rose in the hall and we heard uttered at the very door mama busy mama sing with a cry she sprang from the piano and bounding to the door flung it open and caught her child in her arms darling darling my darling she exclaimed in a burst of mother rapture crushing the child to her breast and kissing it repeatedly then she began to dance holding the baby in her arms and humming a waltz as i stood on one side in my own mood of excited sympathy i caught fleeting glimpses of their two faces as she went whirling about hers was beautiful in her new relief if it was a relief the child's dimpled with delight at the rapid movement a lovely picture letty who stood waiting in the doorway showed a countenance full of surprise mrs packard was the first to feel tired stopping her dance she peered round at the baby's face and laughed was that good she asked are you glad to have mamma merry again i am going to be merry all the time now with such a dear dear dearie of a baby how can i help it and whirling about in my direction she held up the child for inspection crying isn't she a darling do you wonder at my happiness indeed i did not the sweet baby face full of glee was irresistible so was the pat-pat of the two dimpled hands on her mother's shoulders with a longing all women can understand i held out my own arms i wonder if she will come to me said i but though i got a smile the little hands closed still more tightly round the mother's neck mamma dear she cried 
Mama, dear! And the tender emphasis on the endearing word completed the charm. Tears sprang to Mrs. Packard's eyes, and it was with difficulty that she passed the clinging child over to the nurse waiting to take her out. That was the happiest moment of my life, fell unconsciously from Mrs. Packard's lips as the two disappeared. But presently, meeting my eyes, she blushed and made haste to remark, I certainly did Mr. Steele an errant injustice. He was very respectful. I wonder how I ever got the idea he could be anything else. Anxious myself about this very fact, I attempted to reply but she gave me no opportunity. And now for those dinner invitations, she gaily suggested. While I feel like it, I must busy myself in making out my list. It will give me something new to think about. End of chapter 16 Recording by Tom Cosby Chapter 17 of The Mayor's Wife this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Mayor's Wife by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter 17. The Two Weird Sisters. Ellen seemed to understand my anxiety about Mrs. Packard, and to sympathize with it. That afternoon, as I passed her in the hall, she whispered softly, "'I've just been unpacking that bag and putting everything back into place. She told me she had packed it in readiness to go with Mr. Packard if he desired it at the last minute.' I doubted this final statement, but the fact that the bag had been unpacked gave me great relief. I began to look forward with much pleasure to a night of unbroken rest. Alas! Rest was not for me, yet. Relieved as to Mrs. Packard, I found my mind immediately reverting to the topic which had before engrossed it, though always before in her connection. The mystery of the so-called ghosts had been explained, but not the loss of the bonds, which had driven my poor neighbors mad. This was still a fruitful subject of thought, though I knew that such well-balanced and practical minds as Mayor Packard's or Mr. Steele's, would have but little sympathy with the theory ever recurring to me. Could this money still be in the house? The possibility of such a fact worked and worked upon my imagination, till I grew as restless as I had been over the mystery of the ghosts, and presently quite as ready for action. Possibly the hurried glimpse I had got of Miss Thankful's countenance a little while before, in the momentary visit she paid to the attic window, at which I had been accustomed to see either her or her sister constantly sit, inspired me with my present interest in this old and wearing trouble of theirs, and the condition into which it had thrown their minds. I thought of their nights of broken rest, while they were ransacking the rooms below, and testing over and over the same boards, the same panels, for the secret hiding-place of their lost treasure, of their foolish attempts to scare away all other intruders, and the racking of nerve and muscle which must have attended efforts so out of keeping with their age and infirmities. It would be natural to regard the whole matter as a hallucination on their part, to disbelieve the existence of the bonds, and to regard Miss Thankful's whole story to Mrs. Packard as the play of a diseased imagination. But I could not, would not, carry my own doubts to this extent, the bonds had been in existence. Miss Thankful had seen them, and the one question calling for answer now was whether they had been long ago found and carried off, or whether they were still within the reach of the fortunate hand capable of discovering their hiding place. The nurse who, according to Miss Thankful, had wakened such dread in the dying man's breast as to drive him to the attempt which had ended in this complete loss of the whole treasure appeared to me the chief factor in the first theory. If any one had ever found those bonds, it was she. How, it was not for me to say, in my present ignorant state of the events, following the reclosing of the house after this old man's death and burial. But the supposition of an utter failure on the part of this woman 
and of every other subsequent resident of the house to discover this mysterious hiding-place wakened in me no real instinct of search i felt absolutely and at once that any such effort in my present blind state of mind would be totally unavailing the secret trap and the passage it led to with all the opportunities they offered for the concealment of a few folded documents did not strange as it may appear at first blush suggest the spot where these papers might be lying hid the manipulation of the concealed mechanism and the difficulties attending a descent there even on the part of a well man struck me as precluding all idea of any such solution to this mystery strong as dying men sometimes are in the last flickering up of life in the speedily dissolving frame the lowering of this trap and above all the drawing of it back into place which i instinctively felt would be the hardest act of the two would be beyond the utmost fire or force conceivable in a dying man no even if he as a member of the family knew of this subterranean retreat he could not have made use of it i did not even accept the possibility sufficiently to approach the place again with this new inquiry in mind yet what a delight lay in the thought of a possible finding of this old treasure and the new life which would follow its restoration to the hands which had once touched it only to lose it on the instant the charm of this idea was still upon me when i woke the next morning at breakfast i thought of the bonds and in the hour which followed the work i was doing for mrs packard in the library was rendered difficult by the constant recurrence of the one question into my mind what would a man in such a position do with the money he was anxious to protect from the woman he saw coming and secure to his sister who had just stepped next door when a moment came at last in which i could really indulge in these intruding thoughts i leaned back in my chair and tried to reconstruct the room according to mrs packard's description of it at that time i even pulled my chair over to that portion of the room where his bed had stood and choosing the spot where his head would naturally lie threw back my own on the reclining chair i had chosen and allowed my gaze to wander over the walls before me in a vague hope of reproducing in my mind the ideas which must have passed through his before he rose and thrust those papers into their place of concealment alas those walls were barren of all suggestion and my eyes went wandering through the window before me in vague appeal when a sudden remembrance of his last moments struck me sharply and i bounded up with a new thought a new idea which sent me in haste to my room and brought me down again in hat and jacket mrs packard had once said that the ladies next door were pleased to have callers and advised me to visit them i would test her judgment in the matter early though it was i would present myself at the neighboring door and see what my reception would be the discovery i had made in my unfortunate accident in the old entryway should be my excuse apologies were in order from us to them i would make these apologies i was prepared to confront poverty in this bare and comfortless looking abode of decayed gentility but i did not expect quite so many evidences of it as met my eyes as the door swung slowly open some time after my persistent knock and i beheld miss charity's meagre figure outlined against walls and a flight of uncarpeted stairs such as i had never seen before out of a tenement house i may have dropped my eyes but i recovered myself immediately marking the slow awakening of pleasure in the wan old face as she recognized me i uttered some apology for my early call and then waited to see if she would welcome me in she not only did so but did it with such a sudden breaking up of her rigidity into the pliancy of natural hospitable nature that my heart was touched and i followed her into the great bare apartment which must have once answered the purposes of a drawing-room with very different feelings from those which i had been accustomed to look upon her face in the old attic window i should like to see your sister too i said as she hastily but with a certain sort of ceremony too pushed forward one of the ancient chairs which stood at long intervals about the room i have not been your neighbor very long but i should like to pay my respects to both of you i had purposely spoken with the formal precision she had been accustomed to in her earlier days 
and I could see how perceptibly her self-respect returned at this echo of the past, giving her a sudden dignity which made me forget for the moment her neglected appearance. I will summon my sister, she returned, disappearing quietly from the room. I waited fifteen minutes. Then Miss Thankful entered, dressed in her very best, followed by my first acquaintance in her same gown, but with a little cap on her head. The cap, despite its faded ribbons, carefully pressed out, but with too cold an iron, gave her an old-time fashionable air, which for the moment created the impression that she might have been a beauty and a belle in her early days, which I afterward discovered to be true. It was Miss Thankful, however, who had the personal presence, and it was she who now expressed their sense of the honor, pushing forward another chair than that from which I had risen, with the remark, "'Take this, I pray. Many an honored guest has occupied this seat. Let us see you in it.' I could detect no difference between the one she offered and the one in which I had just sat, but I at once stepped forward and took the chair she proffered. She bowed, and Miss Charity bowed, and then they seated themselves side by side on the hair-cloth sofa, which was the only other article of furniture in the room. "'We are... we are preparing to move,' stammered Miss Charity, a faint flush tinging her faded cheeks, as she caught the involuntary glance I had cast about me. Miss Thankful bridled, and gave her sister a look of open rebuke. She had, as one could instantly see from her strong features and purposeful ways, been a woman of decided parts and of strict, upright character. Weakened as she was, the shadow of an untruth disturbed her. Her pride ran in a different groove from that of her once over-complimented, over-fostered sister. She was going to add a protest in words to that expressed by her gesture, but I hastily prevented this by coming at once to the point of my errand. "'My excuse for this early call,' I said, this time addressing Miss Thankful, "'lies in an adventure which occurred to me yesterday in the adjoining house. It was painful to see how they both started, and how they instinctively caught each at the other's hand as they sat side by side on the sofa, as if only thus they could bear the shock of what might be coming next.' I had to nerve myself to proceed. You know, or rather I gather from your kind greetings that you know, that I am at present staying with Mrs. Packard. She is very kind, and we spend many pleasant hours together. But, of course, some of the time I have to be alone, and then I try to amuse myself by looking about at the various interesting things which are scattered through the house. A gasp for Miss Charity— a look still more expressive from Miss Thankful. I hastened to cut their suspense short. You know the little cabinet they have placed in the old entrance, pointing this way? Well, I was looking at that when the whim seized me, I hardly know how, to press one of the knobs in the moulding which runs about the doorway, when instantly everything gave way under me and I fell into a deep hole which had been scooped out of the alleyway. Nobody knows for what." a cry, and they were on their feet, still holding hands and endeavoring to show nothing but concern for my disaster. Oh, I wasn't hurt, I smiled. I was frightened, of course, but not so much as to lose my curiosity. When I got to my feet again, I looked about in this surprising hole. It was our uncle's way of reaching his wine cellar, Miss Thankful explained, with great dignity as she and her sister sank back into their seats. He had some remarkable old wine, and, as he was covetous of it, he conceived this way of securing it from everybody's knowledge but his own. It was a strange way, but he was a little touched, she added, laying a slow, impressive finger on her forehead. Just a little touched, here. The short, significant glance she cast at Charity as she said this, and the little smile she gave, were to give me to understand that this weakness had descended in the family. I felt my heart contract. My self-imposed task was a harder one than I had anticipated, but I could not shirk it now. "'Does this wine cellar you mention run all the way to this house?' I lightly inquired. "'I stumbled on a passage leading here, which I thought you ought to know is now open to any one in Mayor Packard's house. Of course, it will be closed soon,' I hastened to add, as Miss Charity hurriedly rose at her sister's quick look and anxiously left the room. "'Mrs. Packard will see to that.' 
Yes, yes, I have no doubt. She's a very good woman, a very fair woman. Don't you think so, Miss? My name is Saunders. A very good name. I knew a fine family of that name when I was younger. There was one of them. His name was Robert. She rambled on for several minutes, as if this topic and no other filled her whole mind. Then, as if suddenly brought back to what started it, she uttered in sudden anxiety. "'You think well of Mrs. Packard. You have confidence in her.' I allowed myself to speak with all the enthusiasm she so greedily desired. "'Indeed I have,' I cried. "'I think she can be absolutely depended upon to do the right thing every time. You are fortunate in having such good neighbors at the time of this mishap.' At this minute Miss Charity re-entered. Her panting condition, as well as the unsettled position of the cap on her head, told very plainly where she had been. Reseating herself, she looked at Miss Thankful, and Miss Thankful looked at her, but no word passed. They evidently understood each other. "'I am obliged to Mrs. Packard,' now fell from Miss Thankful's lips. "'And to you, too, young lady, for acquainting us with this accident. The passage we extended ourselves after taking up our boat in this house. We—we we did not see why we should profit by our ancestors' old and undiscovered wine-cellar—' to secure certain things which were valuable to us. Her hesitation in uttering this final sentence, a sentence all the more marked because naturally she was a very straightforward person, awoke my doubt and caused me to ask myself what she meant by this word, secure. Did she mean, as circumstances went to show, and as I had hitherto believed, that they had opened up this passage for the purpose of a private search in their old home for the lost valuables they believed to be concealed there? or had they, under some temporary suggestion of their disorganized brains, themselves hidden away among the rafters of this unexplored spot the treasure they believed lost and now constantly bewailed? The doubt thus temporarily raised in my mind made me very uneasy for a moment, but I soon dismissed it, and dropping this subject for the nonce, began to speak of the houses as they now looked, and of the changes which had evidently been made in them since they had left the one and entered the other. I understand, I ventured at last, that in those days this house also had a door opening on the alleyway. Where did it lead? Do you mind my asking? Into a room or into a hallway? I'm so interested in old houses. They did not resent this overt act of curiosity. I had expected Miss Thankful to, but she didn't. Some recollection connected with the name of Saunders, had softened her heart toward me and made her regard with indulgence an interest which she might otherwise have looked upon as intrusive. "'We long ago boarded up that door,' she answered. "'It was of very little use to us from our old library.' "'It looked into one of the rooms, then,' I persisted, but with a wary gentleness which I felt could not offend. "'No, there is no room there, only a passageway. But it had closets in it, and we did not like to be seen going to them any time of day. The door had glass panes in it, you know, just like a window. It made the relations so intimate with people only a few feet away. Naturally, I cried, I don't wonder you wanted to shut them off if you could. Then, with a sudden access of interest, which I vainly tried to hide, I thought of the closets and said with a smile, The closets were for China, I suppose. Old families had so much China. Miss Charity nodded, complacency in every feature, but Miss Thankful thought it more decorous to seem to be indifferent in this matter. Yes, China. Old pieces, not very valuable. We gave what we had of worth to our sister when she married. We kept other things there, too, but they are not important. We seldom go to those closets now, so we don't mind the darkness. I... I dote on old China, I exclaimed, carefully restraining myself from appearing unduly curious. Won't you let me look at it? I know that it is more valuable than you think. It will make me happy for the whole day if you will let me see these old pieces. They may not be beautiful to you, you are so accustomed to them, but to me every one must have a history, or a history my imagination will supply. Miss Charity looked gently but perceptibly frightened. She shook her head, saying in her weak, fond tones, They are too dusty. We are not such housekeepers as we used to be. I am ashamed. But Miss Thankful's peremptory tones cut her short. 
Miss Saunders will excuse a little dust. We are so occupied, she explained, with her eye fixed upon me in almost a challenging way, that we can afford little time for unnecessary housework. If she wants to see these old relics of a former day, let her. You, Charity, lead the way. I was trembling with gratitude and the hopes I had supposed, but I managed to follow the apologetic figure of the humiliated old lady with a very good grace. As we quitted the room we were in, through a door at the end leading into the dark passageway, I thought of the day when, according to Mrs. Packard's story, Miss Thankful had come running across the alley and through this very place to astound her sister and nephew in the drawing-room with the news of the large legacy destined so soon to be theirs. That was two years ago, and to-day I proceeded no further with what was in my mind, for my interest was centred on the closet whose door Miss Charity had just flung open. "'You see,' murmured that lady, "'that we haven't anything of extraordinary interest to show you. Do you want me to hand some of them down? I don't believe that it will pay you.' I cast a look at the shelves, and felt a real disappointment. Not that the china was of too ordinary a nature to attract, but that the pieces I saw, and indeed the full contents of the shelves, failed to include what I was vaguely in search of, and had almost brought my mind into condition to expect. "'Haven't you another closet here?' I faltered. "'These pieces are pretty, but I am sure that you have some that are larger, and with the pattern more dispersed, a platter or a vegetable dish.' "'No, no,' murmured Miss Charity, drawing back as she let the door slip from her hand. "'Really, thankful,' this to her sister, who was pulling open another door, the look of those shelves is positively disreputable. All of the old things we have had in the house for years. Don't— Oh, do let me see that old tureen up on the top shelf, I put in. I like that. Miss Thankful's long arm went up, and, despite Miss Charity's complaint that it was too badly cracked to handle, it was soon down and placed in my hands. I muttered my thanks— gave utterance to sundry outbursts of enthusiasm, then with a sudden stopping of my heartbeats, I lifted the cover and— "'Let me set it down,' I grasped, hurriedly replacing the cover. I was really afraid I should drop it. Miss Thankful took it from me and rested it on the edge of the lower shelf. "'Why, how you tremble, child!' she cried. "'Do you like old colonial blue wear as well as that? If you do, you shall have this piece. Charity, bring a duster.' or better, a damp cloth. You shall have it. Yes, you shall have it. Wait, I could hardly speak. But don't get a cloth yet. Come with me back into the parlor, and bring the tureen. I want to see it in full light. They looked amazed, but they followed me as I made a dash for the drawing-room. Miss Thankful with the tureen in her hands. I was quite mistress of myself before I faced them again, and, sitting down, took the tureen on my lap, greatly to Miss Charity's concern, as to the injury it might do my frock. "'There is something I must tell you about myself before I can accept your gift,' I said. "'What can you have to tell us about yourself that could make us hesitate to bestow upon you such an insignificant piece of cracked old china?' Miss Thankful asked, as I sat looking up at them with moist eyes and wildly beating heart. "'Only this,' I answered. "'I know what perhaps you had rather have me ignorant of.' Mrs. Packard told me about the bonds you lost, and how you thought them still in the house where your brother died, though no one has ever been able to find them there. Oh, sit down, I entreated, as they both turned very pale and looked at each other in a fright. I don't wonder that you have felt their loss keenly. I don't wonder that you have done your utmost to recover them. But what I do wonder at is that you were so sure they were concealed in the room where he lay that you have never thought of looking elsewhere. Do you remember, Miss Quinlan, where his eyes were fixed at the moment of death? On the window directly facing his bed. Gazing at what? A sky. No, the walls of our house. Be more definite. At the old side door through which he could see the closet shelves where this old tureen stood. During the time you had been gone, he had realized his sinking condition, and— Afraid of the nurse he saw advancing down the street, summoned all his strength and rushed with his treasure across the alleyway and put it in the first hiding place his poor old eyes fell on. He may have been going to give it to you, 
but you had company you remember in here and he may have heard voices anyhow we know that he put it in the tureen because here i lifted the lid because i was almost as excited and trembling and beside myself as they were because it is here now they looked then gazed in each other's faces and bowed their heads silence alone could express the emotion of that moment then with a burst of inarticulate cries miss charity rose and solemnly began dancing up and down the great room her sister looked on with grave disapproval till the actual nature of the find made its way into her bewildered mind then she reached over and plunged her hand into the tureen and drew out the five bonds which she clutched first to her breast and then began proudly to unfold fifty thousand dollars she exclaimed we are rich women from to-day and as she said it i saw the shrewdness creep back into her eyes and the long powerful features take on the expressive character which they had so pitifully lacked up to that moment i realized that i had been the witness of a miracle the reason shattered or let us say disturbed by one shock had been restored by another the real miss thankful stood before me meanwhile the weaker sister dancing still was uttering jubilant murmurs to which her feet kept time with almost startling precision but as the other let the words i have recorded here leave her lips she came to a sudden standstill and approaching her lips to miss thankful's ear said joyfully we must tell oh she hastily interpolated as she caught her sister's eyes and followed the direction of her pointing finger we have not thanked our little friend our good little friend who has done us such an inestimable service i felt her quivering arms fall around my neck as miss thankful removed the tureen and in words both reasonable and kind expressed the unbounded gratitude which she herself felt how came you to think how came you to care enough to think fell from her lips as she kissed me on the forehead you are a jewel little miss saunders and some day but i need not relate all that she said or all the extravagant things miss charity did or even my own delight so much greater even than i had anticipated when i first saw this possible ending of my suddenly inspired idea however miss thankful's words as we parted at the door struck me as strange showing that it would be a little while yet before the full balance of her mind was restored tell everybody she cried tell miss packard and all who live in the house but keep it secret from the woman who keeps that little shop we are afraid of her she haunts this neighborhood to get at these very bonds she was the nurse who cared for my brother and it was to escape her greed that he hid this money if she knew that we had found these our lives wouldn't be safe wait till we have them in the bank assuredly i shall tell no one but you must tell those at home she smiled and the beaming light in her kindled eye followed me the few steps i had to take even into the door so bess had been the old man's nurse End of chapter 17of the mayor's wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bethany Simpson. The Mayor's Wife by Anna Catherine Green. Chapter 18, The Morning News. That evening I was made a heroine of by Mrs. Packard and all the other members of the household. Even Nixon thought and showed me his genial side. I had to repeat my story above stairs and below and relate just what the old ladies had done and said and how they bore their joy and whatever I thought they would do with their money now that they had it. When I at last reached my room, my first act was to pull aside my shade and take a peep at the old attic window. Miss Charity's face was there, but so smiling and gay I hardly knew it. She kissed her hand to me as I nodded my head and then turned away with her light as if to show me that she had only been waiting to give me this joyous good night. This was a much better picture to sleep on than the former one had been. Next day I settled back into my old groove. Mrs. Packard busied herself with the embroidery, and I read to her or played on the piano. Happier days seemed approaching, nay, had come. We enjoyed two days of it. Then trouble settled down on us once more. It began on Friday afternoon. Mrs. Packard and I had been out making some arrangements for the projected dinner party, 
and I had stopped for a minute in the library before going upstairs. A pile of mail lay on the table. Running this over with a rapid hand, she singled out several letters which she began to open. Their contents seemed far from satisfactory. Exclamation after exclamation left her lips, her agitation increasing with each one she read, and her haste, too, till finally it seemed sufficient for her just to glance at the unfolded sheet before letting it drop. When the last one had left her hand, she turned, and encountering my anxious look, bitterly remarked, we need not have made these arrangements this morning. Seven regrets in the mail, and two in the early one. Nine regrets in all. And I sent out only ten invitations. What is the meaning of it? I begin to feel myself ostracized. I did not understand it any more than she did. Invite others, I suggested, and was sorry for my presumption the next minute. Her poor lip trembled. I do not dare, she whispered. Oh, what will Mr. Packard say? Someone or something is working against us. We have enemies. Enemies! And Mr. Packard will never get his election. Her trouble was natural, and so was her expression of it. Feeling for her, and all the more that the cause of this concerted action against her was as much a mystery to me as it was to herself, I made some attempt to comfort her, which was futile enough, God knows. She heard my voice, no doubt, but she gave no evidence of noting what I said. When I had finished, that is, when she no longer heard me speaking, she let her head droop, and presently I heard her murmur, It seems to me that if for any reason he fails to get his election, I shall wish to die. She was in this state of dejection, with the echo of this sad sentence in both our ears, when a light tap at the door was followed by the entrance of Letty, the nursemaid. She wore an unusual look of embarrassment, and held something crushed in her hand. Mrs. Packard advanced hurriedly to meet her. "'What is it?' she interrogated sharply, like one expectant of evil tidings. "'Nothing. That is, not much,' stammered the frightened girl, attempting to thrust her hand behind her back. But Mrs. Packard was too quick for her. "'You have something there. What is it? Let me see.' The girl's hand moved forward reluctantly. "'A paper which I found pinned to the baby's coat when I took her out of the carriage,' she faltered. "'I, I don't know what it means.' Mrs. Packard's eyes opened wide with horror. She seized the paper and staggered with it to one of the windows. While she looked at it, I cast a glance at Letty. She was crying from what looked like pure fear, but it was the fear of ignorance rather than duplicity. She appeared as much mystified as ourselves. Meanwhile, I felt, rather than saw, the old shadow settling fast upon the head of her who was an hour before so bright. She had chosen a place where her form could not fail of being more or less concealed by the curtain, and though I heard the paper rattle, I could not see it or the hand which held it. But the time she spent over it seemed interminable, before I heard her utter a sharp cry and saw the curtains shake as she clutched them. It seemed the proper moment to proffer help, but before either Letty or I could start forward, her command rang out in smothered but peremptory tones, "'Keep back. I want no one here.' and we stopped, each looking at the other in very natural consternation. And when, after another seemingly interminable interval, she finally stepped forth, I noted a haggard change in her face, and that her coat had been torn open, and even the front of her dress wretched apart, as if she had felt herself suffocating, or as if, but this alternative only suggested itself to me later, and I shall refrain from mentioning it now. Crossing the floor with a stumbling step, with the paper which had roused all this indignation still in her hand, she paused before the now seriously alarmed Letty, and demanded in great excitement, "'Who pinned that paper on my child? You know, you saw it done. Was it a man, or—' "'Oh, no, ma'am, no, ma'am,' protested the girl. "'No man came near her. It was a woman. A nice-looking woman. A woman!' Mrs. Packard's tone was incredulous, but the girl insisted. "'Yes, ma'am, there was no man there at all. "'I was on one of the park benches resting with the baby in my arms, "'and this woman passed by and saw us. "'She smiled at the baby's ways "'and then stopped and took to talking about her, "'how pretty she was and how little afraid of strangers. "'I saw no harm in the woman, ma'am, "'and let her sit down on the same bench with me for a few minutes. "'She must have pinned the paper on the baby's coat then, "'for it was the only time anybody was near enough to do it.' Mrs. Packard, with an irrepressible gesture of anger or dismay, turned and walked back to the window. The movement was a natural one. 
certainly she was excusable for wishing to hide from the girl the full extent of the agitation into which this misadventure had thrown her. "'You may go.' The words came after a moment of silent suspense. "'Give the baby her supper. I know that you will never let anyone else come so near her again.' Letty probably did not catch the secret anguish hidden in her tone, but I did, and after the nursemaid was gone, I waited anxiously for what Mrs. Packard would say. It came from the window and conveyed nothing. Would I do so-and-so? I forget what her requests were, only that they necessitated my leaving the room. There seemed no alternative but to obey, yet I felt loath to leave her, and was hesitating near the doorway when a new interruption occurred. Nixon brought in a telegram, and, as Mrs. Packard advanced to take it, she threw on the table the slip of paper which she had been poring over behind the curtains. As I stepped back at Nixon's entrance, I was near the table, and the single glance I gave this paper as it fell showed me that it was covered with the same Hebrew-like characters, of which I already possessed more than one example. The surprise was acute, but the opportunity which came with it was one I could not let slip. Meeting her eye as the door closed on Nixon, I pointed at the scrawl she had thrown down, and wonderingly asked her if that was what Letty had found pinned to the baby's coat. With a surprised start, she paused in her act of opening the telegram, and made a motion as if to repossess herself of this, but seeming to think better of it, she confined herself to giving me a sharp look. Yes, was her curt assent. I summoned up all my courage, possibly all my powers of acting. Why, what is there in unreadable characters like these to alarm you? She forgot her telegram, she forgot everything, but that here was a question she must answer in a way to disarm all suspicion. The fact, she accentuated gravely, that they are unreadable. What menace may they not contain? I am afraid of them as I am of all obscure and mystifying things. In a flash, at the utterance of these words, I saw my way to the fulfillment of the wish which had actuated me from the instant my eyes had fallen on this paper. "'Do you think it is a cipher?' I asked. "'A cipher? I have always been good at puzzles. I wish you would let me see what I can make out of these rows of broken squares and topsy-turvy angles. Perhaps I can prove to you that they contain nothing to alarm you.' The gleam of something almost ferocious sprang into this gentle woman's eyes. Her lips moved, and I expected an angry denial, but fear kept her back. She did not dare to appear to understand this paper any better than I did. Besides, she was doubtless conscious that its secret was not one to yield to any mere puzzle-reader. She could safely thrust it to my curiosity. All this I detected in her changing expression, before she made the slightest gesture which allowed me to secure what I felt to be the most valuable acquisition in the present exigency. Then she turned to her telegram. It was from her husband, and I was not prepared for the cry of dismay which left her lips as she read it nor for the increased excitement into which she was thrown by its few and seemingly simple words. With apparent forgetfulness of what had just occurred, a forgetfulness which insensibly carried her back to the moment when she had given me some order which involved my departure from the room, she impetuously called out over her shoulder, which she had turned upon opening the telegram, "'Miss Saunders! Miss Saunders, are you there? Bring me the morning papers! Bring me the morning papers!' Instantly I remembered that we had not read the papers." Contrary to our usual habit, we had gone about a pressing piece of work without a glance at any of the three dailies laid to hand in their usual place on the library table. "'They're here on the table,' I replied, wondering as much at the hectic flush which now enlivened her features as at the extreme paleness that had marked them the moment before. "'Search them. There's something new in them about me. There must be. Read Mr. Packard's message.' I took it from her hand. Only eight words in all. Here they are the marks of separation being mine. I am coming. Libel, I know. Where is S? Henry. Search the columns, she repeated as I laid the telegram down. Search, search. I hastily obeyed, but it took me some time to find the paragraph I sought. The certainty that others in the house had read these papers, if we had not, disturbed me. I recalled certain glances which I had seen pass between the servants behind Mrs. Packard's back glances which I had barely noted at the time, but which returned to my mind now with forceful meaning, as if these busy girls had read all the town had read. What? Suddenly I found it. 
She saw my eyes stop in their hurried scanning, and my fingers clutch the sheet more firmly. And drawing up behind me, she attempted to follow with her eyes the words I reluctantly read out. Here they are, just as they left my trembling lips that day. Words that only the most rabid of opponents could have instigated. Apropos of the late disgraceful discoveries by which a woman of apparent means and unsullied honor has been precipitated from her proud preeminence as a leader of fashion, how many women known and admired today could stand the test of such an inquiry as she was subjected to? We know one at least, high in position and aiming at a higher, who, if the merciful veil were withdrawn which protects the secrets of the heart, would show such a dark spot in her life that even the aegis of the greatest power in the state would be powerless to shield her from the indignation of those who now speak loudest in her praise. "'A lie!' burst a vehement protest from Mrs. Packard, as I finished. "'A lie, like the rest! But, oh, the shame of it! A shame that will kill me!' Then suddenly, and with a kind of cold horror— it is this which has destroyed my social prestige in town. I understand those nine declinations now. Henry, my poor Henry. There was little comfort to offer, but I tried to divert her mind to the practical aspect of the case by saying, What can Mr. Steele be doing? He does not seem to be very successful in his attempts to carry out the mayor's orders. See, your husband asks where he is. He can mean no other by the words, Where is S? He knew that your mind would supply the name. Yes. Her eyes had become fixed. Her whole face betrayed a settled despair. Quickly, violently, she rang the bell. Nixon appeared. She advanced hurriedly to meet him. Nixon, you have Mr. Steele's address? Yes, Mrs. Packard. Then go to it at once. Find Mr. Steele if you can. But if that is not possible, learn where he has gone and come right back and tell me. Mr. Packard telegraphs to know where he is. He has not joined the mayor in C. Yes, Mrs. Packard, the house is not far. I shall be back in fifteen minutes. The words were respectful, but the sly glint in his blinking eye as he hastened out fixed my thoughts again on this man, and the uncommon attitude he maintained toward the mistress whose behests he nevertheless flew to obey. End of chapter 18 Recorded by Bethany Simpson in Los Angeles in October 2012. Chapter 19 of The Mayor's Wife This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mayor's Wife by Anna Catherine Green Chapter 19 The Cry from the Stairs I was alone in the library when Nixon returned. He must have seen Mrs. Packard go up before he left, for he passed by without stopping, and the next moment I heard his foot on the stairs. Some impulse made me step into the hall and cast a glance at his ascending figure. I could see only his back, but there was something which I did not like in the curve of that back, and the slide of his hand as it moved along the stair rail. His was not an open nature at the best. I almost forgot the importance of his errand in watching the man himself. Had he not been a servant, but he was, and an old and foolishly fussy one. I would not imagine follies. Only I wished I could follow him into Mrs. Packard's presence. His stay, however, was too short for much to have been gained thereby. Almost immediately he reappeared, shaking his head and looking very much disturbed, and I was watching his pottering descent when he was startled, and I was startled, by two cries which rang out simultaneously from above, one of pain and distress from the room he had just left, and one expressive of the utmost glee, from the lips of the baby whom the nursemaid was bringing down from the upper hall. Appalled by the anguish expressed in the mother's cry, I was bounding upstairs when my course was stopped by one of the most poignant sights it has ever been my lot to witness. Mrs. Packard had heard her child's laugh, and flying from her room had met the little one on the threshold of her door, and now crying and sobbing, was kneeling with the child in her arms in the open space at the top of the stairs. 
her paroxysm of grief, wild and unconstrained as it was, gave less hint of madness than of intolerable suffering. Wondering at an abandonment which bespoke a grief too great for all further concealment, I glanced again at Nixon. He had paused in the middle of the staircase, and was looking back in a dubious way, denoting hesitation. But as the full force of the tragic scene above made itself felt in his slow mind, he showed a disposition to escape, and tremblingly continued his descent. He was nearly upon me when he caught my eye. A glare awoke in his, and seeing his right arm rise threateningly, I thought he would certainly strike me. But he slid by without doing so. What did it mean? Oh, what did it all mean? End of chapter 19 Recording by Winna Hathaway in Fayetteville, North Carolina Chapter 20 of The Mayor's Wife This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Mayor's Wife by Anna Catherine Green Chapter 20 Explanation Determined to know the cause of Mrs. Packard's anguish, if not of Nixon's unprovoked anger against myself, I caught him back as he was passing me, and peremptorily demanded, What message did you carry to Mrs. Packard to throw her into such a state as this? Answer! I am in this house to protect her against all such disturbances. What did you tell her? Nothing. Sullenness itself in the tone. Nothing? And you were sent on an errand? Didn't you fulfill it? Yes. And didn't tell her what you learned? No. Why? She didn't give me the chance. Oh. I know it sounds queer, miss, but it's true. She didn't give me a chance to talk. He muttered the final sentence. Indeed, all that we had said until now had been in a subdued tone, but now my voice unconsciously rose. You found Mr. Steele? No, miss. He was not at home. But I told you where to look for him. No. His landlady thinks he is dead. He has queer spells, and someone had sent her a word about a man, handsome like him, who was found dead at Hudson Three Corners last night. Mr. Steele told her he was going over to Hudson Three Corners. She has sent to see if the dead man is he. The dead man? Who spoke? Not Mrs. Packard. Surely that voice was another's. Yet we both looked up to see. The sight which met our eyes was astonishing, appalling. She had let her baby slip to the floor, and had advanced to the stairs, where she stood, clutching at the rail, looking down upon us, with a joy in her face, matching the unholy elation we could still hear ringing in that word, dead. Such a look might have leaped to life in the eyes of the Medusa, when she turned her beauty upon her foredoomed victims. Dead! came again in ringing repetition from Mrs. Packard's lips, every fiber in a tense form, quivering and the gleam of hope shining brighter and brighter in her countenance. No, not dead. Then, while Nixon trembled and succumbed inwardly to this spectacle of a gentle-hearted woman, transformed by some secret and overwhelming emotion into an image of vindictive delight, her hands left the stair-rail, and flew straight up over her head, in the transcendent gesture which only the greatest crisis in life call forth, and she exclaimed with awe-inspiring emphasis, God could not have been so merciful! It is not often, perhaps it is only once in a lifetime, that it is given to us to look straight into the innermost recesses of the human soul. Never before had such an opportunity come to me and possibly never would it come again. Yet my first conscious impulse was one of fright at the appalling self-revelation she had made. 
not only in my hearing, but in that of nearly her whole household. I could see, over her shoulders, Letty's eyes staring wide in ingenuous dismay, while from the hall below rose the sound of hurrying feet as the girls came running in from the kitchen. Something must be done, and immediately, to recall her to herself, and if possible, to reinstate her in the eyes of her servants. Bounding upward to where she still stood forgetful and self-absorbed, I laid my hand softly, but firmly on hers, which had fallen back upon the rail, and quietly said, "'You have some very strong reason, I see, for looking upon Mr. Steele as your husband's enemy, rather than friend.' The appeal was timely. With a start she woke to the realization of her position, and of the suggestive words she had just uttered, and with a glance behind her at Letty, and another at Nixon and the maids, who by this time had pushed her way to the foot of the stairs, she gathered herself up with a determination, born of the necessity of the moment, and emphatically replied, "'No, I do not know Mr. Steele well enough for that.' My emotion at the unexpected tidings of his possible death springs from another cause. Here the help, the explanation for which she had been searching, came. Girls, she went on, addressing them with an emphasis which drew all eyes, I am ashamed to tell you what has so deeply disturbed me these last few days. I should blame any one of you for being affected as I was. The great love I bear my husband and child is my excuse. A poor one, I know, but one you will understand. A week ago, something happened to me in the library, which frightened me very much. I saw, or thought I saw, what someone would call an apparition, but what you would call a ghost. Don't shriek! The two girls behind me had begun to scream and make as if to run away. It was all imagination, of course. There cannot really be any such thing. Ghosts in these days? Pshaw! But I was very nervous that night, and could not help feeling that the mere fact of my thinking of anything so dreadful meant misfortune to someone in this house. Wait! Her voice was imperious, and the shivering, terrified girls, superstitious to the backbone, stopped in spite of themselves. You must hear it all, and you too, Miss Sanders, who have only heard half. I was badly frightened then, especially as the ghost, spirit man, or whatever it was, wore a look, in the one short moment I stood face to face with it, full of threat and warning. Next day, Mr. Packard introduced his new secretary. Girls, he had the face of the something I had seen, without the threatening look which had so alarmed me. Bad says to him, rang in vigorous denunciation from the cook. Why didn't you send him immediately about his business? It's trouble he'll bring to us all, and no mistake. That was what I feared, assented her now thoroughly composed mistress. So when Nixon said just now that Mr. Steele was dead, had fallen in a fit at Hudson Three Corners, or something like that. I felt such wicked relief at finding that my experience had not meant danger to ourselves, but to him, wicked, because it was so selfish, that I forgot myself and cried out in the way you all heard. Blame me, if you will, but don't frighten yourselves by talking about it. If Mr. Steele is indeed dead... We have enough to trouble us without that. And with a last glance at me, which ended in a wavering half-deprecatory smile, she stepped back and passed into her own room. The mood in which I proceeded to my own quarters was as thoughtful as any I had ever experienced. End of chapter 20 Recording by Winna Hathaway in Fayetteville, North Carolina Twenty one of the Mayor's Wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Lynn Thompson The Mayor's Wife by Anna Catherine Green Chapter 21 The Cipher Hitherto I had mainly admired Mrs. Packard's person and the extreme charm of manner which never deserted her, no matter how she felt. Now I found myself compelled to admire the force and quality of her mind, her readiness to meet emergencies, and the tact with which she had availed herself of the superstition latent in the Irish temperament. For I had no more faith in the explanation she had seen fit to give these ignorant girls than I had in the apparition itself. Emotion such as she had shown called for a more matter-of-fact basis than the one she had ascribed to it. No unreal and purely superstitious reason would account for the extreme joy and self-abandonment with which she had hailed the possibility of Mr. Steele's death. The no she had given me when I asked if she considered this man her husband's enemy had been a lying no. To her, for some cause as yet unexplained, the secretary was a dangerous ally to the man she loved. An ally so near and so dangerous that the mere rumour of his death was capable of lifting her from the depths of despondency into a state of abnormal exhilaration and hope. Now why? What reason had she for this belief, and how was it in my power to solve the mystery which I felt to be at the bottom of all the rest? But one means suggested itself. I was now assured that Mrs. Packard would never take me into her actual confidence any more than she had taken her husband. What I learned must be in spite of her precautions. The cipher of which I had several specimens might, if properly read, give me the clue I sought. I had a free hour before me. Why not employ it in an endeavour to pick out the meaning of those odd Hebraic characters? I had, in a way, received her sanction to do so, if I could. And if I should succeed, what shadows might it not clear from the path of the good man whose interest it was my chief duty to consult? Ciphers have always possessed a fascination for me. This one, from the variety of its symbols, offered a study of unusual interest. Collecting the stray specimens which I had picked up, I sat down in my cosy little room and laid them all out before me, with the following result. Number one. My copy of the characters, as I remember seeing them, on the envelope which Mrs. Packard had offered to Mr. Steele, and afterward thrown into the fire. Numbers two, three, and four. The discarded scraps I had taken from the wastebasket in her room. Number five. The lengthy communication in another hand, which Mrs. Packard had found pinned on the baby's cloak, and at my intercession had handed over to me. A goodly array, if the latter was a specimen of the same cipher as the first, a fact which its general appearance seemed to establish, notwithstanding a few added complexities observable in it, and one which a remembrance of her extreme agitation on opening it would have settled in my mind, even if these complexities had been greater and the differences even more pronounced than they were. Lines entirely unsuggestive of meaning to her might have aroused her wonder and possibly her anger, but not her fear, and the emotion which I chiefly observed in her at that moment had been fear. So, out of these 150 characters, many of them mere repetitions, it remained for me to discover a key whereby their meaning might be rendered intelligible. To begin, then, what peculiarities were first observable in them? Several. First, the symbols followed one after the other without breaks, whether the communication was limited to one word or to many. Second, numbers two, three, and four started with the identical characters which made up number one. Third, while certain lines of numbers two, three, and four were heavier than others, no such distinction was observable in the characters forming number one. Fourth, this distinction was even more marked in the longer specimen written by another hand, viz. number five. Fifth, this distinction, which we will call shading, occurred intermittently, sometimes in two consecutive characters, but never in three. Sixth, this shading was to be seen now on one limb of the character it apparently emphasized, and now on another. Seventh, 
in the three specimens of the seven similar characters commencing numbers two three and four the exact part shaded was not always the same as for instance it was the left arm of the second character in number two which showed the heavy line while the shading was on the right hand arm of the corresponding character in number three eighth these variations of emphasis in number four coincided sometimes with those seen in number two and again with those in number three ninth each one of these specimens saving the first ended in a shaded character tenth while some of the characters were square or parts of a square others were in the shape of a y turned now this way and now that eleventh these characters were varied by the introduction of dots and in some cases by the insertion of minute sketches of animals birds arrows signs of the zodiac etc with here and there one of a humorous possibly sarcastic nature twelfth dots and dots only were to be found in the specimen emanating from mrs packard's hand birds arrows skipping boys and hanging men etc were confined to number five the product of another brain and hand at present unknown now what conclusions could i draw from these i shall give them to you as they came to me that night others with wits superior to my own may draw additional and more suggestive ones first division into words was not considered necessary or was made in some other way than by breaks second the fact of the shading being omitted from number one meant nothing that specimen being my own memory of lines the shading or non-shading of which would hardly have attracted my attention third the similarity observable in the seven opening characters of the first four specimens being taken as a proof of their standing for the same word or phrase it was safe to consider this word or phrase as a complete one to which she had tried to fit others and always to her dissatisfaction till she had finally rejected all but the simple one with which she had started fourth number one short as it was was therefore a communication in itself fifth the shading of a character was in some way essential to its proper understanding but not the exact place where that shading fell sixth the dots were necessarily modifications but not their shape or nature seventh this shading might indicate the end of a word eighth if so the shading of two contiguous characters would show the first one to be a word of one letter there are but two words in the english language of one letter a and i and in the specimens before me but one character that of a square which shows shading next to another shaded character ninth square was therefore a or i a decided start all this of course was simply preliminary the real task still lay before me it was to solve the meaning of those first seven characters which if my theory were correct was a communication in itself and one of such importance that once mastered it would give the key to the whole situation or with the shading you have all read the gold bug and know something of the method by which a solution is obtained by that simplest of all ciphers where a fixed character takes the place of each letter in the alphabet let us see if it applies to this one there are 26 letters in the English alphabet. Are there 26 or nearly 26 different characters in the 101 I find inscribed on the various slips spread out before me? No, there are but 14. A check to begin with. But wait, the dots make a difference. Let us increase the list by assuming that angles or squares thus marked are different letters from those of the same shape in which no dots or sketches occur and we bring the list up to twenty that is better the dotted or otherwise marked squares or angles are separate characters now which one of these appears most frequently the square which we have already decided must be either a or i in the one short word or phrase we are at present considering it occurs twice now supposing that this square stands for a which according to poe's theory it should 
a coming before s in the frequency in which it occurs in ordinary english sentences how would the phrase look still according to poe with dashes taking the place of the remaining unknown letters thus a dash a dash dash if the whole is a single word a dash a dash if the whole is a phrase that it was a phrase i was convinced possibly because one clings so neat a theory as the one which makes the shading so marked a feature in all the specimens before us the sign of division into words let us take these seven characters as a phrase then and not as a word what follows the dashes following the two a's stand for letters each of which should make a word when joined to a what are these letters run over the alphabet and see the only letters making sense when joined with a are h m n s t or x discarding the first and the last we have these four words am an as at is it possible to start any intelligible phrase with any two of these arranged in any conceivable way no then square cannot stand for a let us see if it does for i the words of two letters headed by i we find to be if in is and it a more promising collection than the first one could easily start a phrase with any of these even with any two of them such as if it is in is it it is square is then the symbol of i and some one of the above-named combinations forms the beginning of the short phrase ending with a word of three letters symbolized b dash bracket what word if my reasoning is correct up to this point it should not be hard to determine first one of these three symbols the v is a repetition of one of those we have already shown to be s t f or n of the remaining two one must be a vowel that is it must be either u e o u or y i being already determined upon how many dashes and brackets do we find in the collection before us ten or more of the first and six or about six of the latter recalling the table made out by poe a table i once learned as a necessary part of my schooling as a cipher interpreter i ran over it thus e is the one letter most in use in english afterward the succession runs thus a o i d h n r etc there being then ten dashes to six brackets dash must be a vowel and in all probability the vowel e since no other character in the whole collection save the plentiful squares is repeated so often i am a patient woman usually but i was nervous that night and perhaps too deeply interested in the outcome to do myself justice i could think of no word with a for one of its three letters which would make sense when added to it is is it if it is in conscious of no mistake yet always alive to the possibility of one i dropped the isolated scrap i was working upon and took up the longer and fuller ones and with them a fresh line of reasoning if my arguments so far had been trustworthy i should find in these other specimens a double dash standing for the double e so frequently found in english did i find such no another shock to my theory should i then give up not while other means of verification remained the word the should occur more than once in a collection of words as long as the one before me if u is really e i should find it at the end of the supposed these do i so find it there are several words scattered through the whole of only three letters are any of them terminated by u not one my theory is false then and i must begin all over discarding every previous conclusion save this that the shading of a line designated the termination of a word i hunted first for the these making a list of the words containing only three letters i was confronted by the following no two alike astonishing thirty-two words of english and only one v in the whole could it be that the cipher was in a foreign language 
The preponderance of eyes, so out of proportion to the other vowels, had already given me this fear, but the lack of these seemed positively to indicate it. Yet I must dig deeper before accepting defeat. TH is a combination of letters which Poe says occurs so often in our language that they can be easily picked out in a cipher of this length. How many times can a conjunction of two similar characters be found in the lines before us? Bracket dash occurs three times, which is often enough, perhaps, to establish the fact that they stand for TH. Do I find them joined with the third character in the list of possible V's? Yes. Bracket dash, which would seem to fix both the TH and the E. But I have grown wary and must make myself sure. Do I find a word in which this combination of bracket dash occurs twice, as sometimes happens with the TH we are considering? No, but I find two other instances in which like contiguous symbols do appear twice in one word. The bracket dash in number three and the VC in number four, a discovery the most embarrassing of all, since in both cases the symbols which begin the word are reversed at its end. As witness. For if VC stands for TH and the whole word showed in letters TH, HT, which to any eye suggests the word thought, what does bracket dash stand for concerning which the same conditions are observable? I could not answer. I had run on a snag. Rules which applied to one part of the cipher failed in another. Could it be that a key was necessary to its proper solution? I began to think so, and moreover that Mrs. Packard had made use of some such help as I watched her puzzling in the window over these symbols. I recalled her movements, the length of time which elapsed before a cry of miserable understanding escaped her lips, the fact that her dress was torn apart at the throat when she came out, and decided that she had not only drawn some paper from her bosom helpful to the elucidation of these symbols, but that this paper was the one which had been the object of her frantic search the night I watched her shadow on the wall. So convinced was I by these thoughts that any further attempt to solve the cryptogram without such aid as I have mentioned, would end by leaving me where I was at present, that is, in the fog, that I allowed the lateness of the hour to influence me, and putting aside my papers, I went to bed. If I had sat over them another hour, should I have been more fortunate? Make the attempt yourself, and see. End of chapter 21